Uh, Corinne Morasco, Chair, Department of Neurosurgery, University of Michigan, for listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Corinne Morasco, Head of Neurosurgery at the University of Michigan and the first woman to chair an academic neurosurgery department in the United States. Dr. Morasco specializes in pediatric neurosurgery and is a member of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and the Congress of Neurological Surgeons and with several pediatric professional associations. Dr. Morasco was elected as the first woman to be the president of the Society of Neurological Surgeons during the CNS Centennial Celebration Year. She's a founding member of the Women in Neurosurgery. Hello everyone and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today we welcome Dr. Corinne Morasco, Chair of Neurosurgery at University of Michigan. Doc, how are we doing today? Doing very well, sir. Thank you for joining us. So let's just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency and how did those change throughout your fellowship? Uh, well, I think the first thing to say is that at the time that I trained, there were not a lot of women in neurosurgery and there certainly were not um, anyone that was quite like me. Uh, I stand just a little bit under five foot, uh, wore a full length leg brace um, and therefore had a disability. So in neurosurgery, that's kind of a, uh, when you described those characteristics, you were generally describing one person, that was me. Uh, so at the time, getting into a neurosurgical residency was high on my list. Um, I decided that I wanted to be a neurosurgeon sometime in medical school. And I realized that the competition to get into a neurosurgical residency was really uh, significant. It was difficult. So I would say my initial goal was just to get in. I think the second and probably the most important one was to make certain that as a neurosurgical resident, I was learning as much as I could to be a capable neurosurgeon. Uh, and then for me, because I was um, you know, somewhat distinctive and different, I also wanted to make certain that the people I worked with saw me as being um, a strong uh, resident, someone who worked hard someone who was capable, someone who was knowledgeable. Um, I think that another part of it was understanding as well, if I'm going to be a neurosurgical resident, what is it going to take for me to um, do the job well? And so I think each year in residency, you learn a little bit more about yourself, a little bit more about the goals of uh, becoming a neurosurgeon. And I think you grow in confidence. Um, I think by the time you finish a residency, you start to really feel that tremendous strength, if you will, of uh, having a, a wide knowledge base in lots of cases. Um, I think I realized that as a chief resident, particularly in neurosurgery, um, you could realize a given week that was going to be unlike any that was going to be in your practice. Because as a chief resident in neurosurgery, you have your pick of some of the best cases by some of the best faculty, and you are choosing them and working through them every single day. And that practice is not a practice of one. It's a practice of all the faculty that you're working with. And I think that's one of the things that I think, um, particularly when people get out of their uh, residency, will often say, gee, I didn't realize what a spectacular experience I was having during that time. I was just so busy working through it. And then suddenly you get out there and you realize, whoa, that was 10 different people's, you know, experiences that you were, you know, gaining from. And I think that's also part of it. Um, but for me, I think that uh, I, I, I was very, it was important to me to be respected by my colleagues and important for me to be respected by my co-residents. So going through that fellowship, can you kind of give us your mentality going into your first job search and how that perspective changed the beginning years of your career? I knew I wanted to do pediatric neurosurgery, and I knew that that required additional training. Uh, and so I focused on that as part of uh, what I did it when I was at my residency, which, just a, which was at Columbia. Uh, when I was looking at what I wanted to do afterwards, I knew very much that uh, my mindset was that of an academic neurosurgeon. I liked research. I liked working with other residents. I liked teaching. And frankly, for me at least, the things I wanted to do in pediatric neurosurgery were better and going to be done better, and it wasn't private practice, but was, which was academics. Um, so what I looked at, what I was thinking about, uh, I really 
thought about improving some of the things that I had done in research to give my credentials to understand more about what an academic practice might be. Um, I knew I was very interested in pediatric brain tumors. Uh, to me, one of the things that was devastating and one of the things I saw in my training as a pediatric neurosurgeon was the extent to which we still had so much to learn about taking care of kids, particularly um, kids with brain tumors. So I looked at where I could do some really great research and gain some experience, and NIH was that place. So I went to the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, and I spent two years there uh, doing work primarily in pediatric brain tumors, uh, doing um, you know uh, analysis of immunotoxins and working on developing new therapies for treating kids with brain tumors. Uh, during that uh, time, I think I began to realize as well, though, that I missed not operating a lot. The amount that it, I was operating at, at NIH was, it was there. I was doing regular cases, but it just wasn't a very busy practice. And the kids that I was operating on were very focused and very specific to um, research protocols. And, and recognizing that for me, it was important. The first job I really looked at after NIH was to find a place where um, I would really do well in pediatric neurosurgery. At the time, there were a series of different places that were open, and so I looked around at various places in the country. I was born and bred as a East Coast gal, having spent most of my time in New York City and in New Jersey, and so really I had a little bit of the New Yorker's mentality of the rest of the world. You know, there's New York City, there's a little blip somewhere around Chicago, maybe another little blip towards LA, but pretty much everything dies at the Hudson River. And I think I kind of knew that um, if I really wanted a good practice, though, I needed to look around. Uh, for me, looking at Michigan, uh, I, I had a plan. I was going to spend five years at the University of Michigan because it looked like a good job, and then go back to the East Coast, go back and to be there. Um, and I really chose the job for probably two main reasons. One, I wanted to go to a place where I liked the people because I understood very much that I personally excel, work harder, and have a better sense of happiness in a place where I like the people that I'm working with and that I feel I can contribute to. The second thing was I very much wanted to be in a practice where there was a senior pediatric neurosurgeon that I could work with and I could partner with. Um, so I looked around at a bunch of different places and I chose of the five places that were available with jobs at the time to be at Michigan because I thought it was a really great place for me with the people that were there. Um, when I arrived at Michigan, uh, my partner, my senior partner, handed me her beeper and her keys and said, I'm going on sabbatical for four months. So I was a little surprised. And, you know, it was, a, it was different than the job I had initially hired into, but it was, you know, it was still a, a group of good people in the rest of the department. And so I felt very supported and felt like it was a, a good thing to do. Um, she came back after her four months worked for about, let's say, six weeks, and then retired. So I suddenly became the only pediatric neurosurgeon at the University of Michigan. And um, I had a partner for a short time, and then eventually was alone, essentially, for, the, for a considerable period of time. It was interesting because what it did was alter my job expectations a little bit. And I think that is one thing that becomes important. You have to be adaptable when you're starting out because... If you're not adaptable, I don't think you necessarily have given yourself or the job the best possible chance. If you become very rigid, at least for me, that was true. If you get too rigid about what you expect and what you are, want to um, do, I don't think you take advantage of some of the opportunities that may be there. And so I've looked at my partners and almost all of us have in some way, shape or form changed some of our expectations 
or plans based on the opportunities that were available to us and the circumstances that we're, we were dealing with. It's easier to do that in an environment which is supportive of you. And that's why I always tell people that I work with or residents that I train, choose a job more for the people than almost anything else. Um, I knew I wanted to do pediatric neurosurgery and I, I also thought that I wanted to spend a significant amount of time in the lab. That lab time became foreshortened because I had so much clinical responsibility but I still was able to develop collaborations with others that allowed me to at least get that, if you will, fix of uh, research as part of my practice. And I work with a, a group of people who uh, are, were decent, um, thoughtful, um, good individuals who I think supported me and made me not only a better uh, physician and surgeon, but also um, someone who enjoyed going to work every day. Now, as the first female to chair an academic neurosurgery department program in the United States, what were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed to the top of the industry? Well, first of all, I think that um, a chair is maybe not the top of your industry. I think chairs are, are, are managers. I mean, um, again, I think that... Uh, I recognize that being the first woman to chair an academic neurosurgery practice, there was gonna be a lot of focus. It's inevitable. I mean, yeah, I know we're a small group of people, but at least in my group of, of uh, colleagues, there was gonna be some scrutiny, um, some, uh, a certain amount of assessment as to what I was doing. It was very important for me um, to make sure that the department I was gonna lead which I'd been a part of for, for a series of years, did not um, go downhill first off. And that, the, that it stayed a strong academic uh, neurosurgical practice with um, a collegial environment, which can sometimes be unique. Um, neurosurgeons are, are usually very smart individuals who uh, work very hard and are somewhat, almost a little bit crazy in, in the way they enjoy their lives. And, what they do, and we can often be difficult. I mean, you don't get a group of really, really talented, smart people in a room and assume that they're all gonna uh, just play nice in the sandbox. But we all did. I mean, we had a strong uh, um, camaraderie among the people that I worked with where we really viewed ourselves as a very cohesive and coherent department. And it was important to me to make sure that that environment um, stayed intact. Michigan is sometimes described as a very gentlemanly um, uh, neurosurgical department. I always find that a little frustrating because it implies somehow that we're all sitting around having tea in the afternoon. But um, what we do is we mutually, we, we are very mutually respectful. Um, I think we believe, and I, I, I know we believe that in taking care of each other well, we also take care of our patients well. And, um, I think the one thing that was also extremely important to me was to make certain that in the process of doing this, what I did was help my colleagues to have the resources available to them to do the things they wanted to do. Um, it was a chance to think about how I could make the department better. It was a, a, a way in which I could make certain that the talents of the people that um, I worked with were known by others because sometimes, particularly Midwesterners, have a hard time telling people how good they really are. And as a chair, that's your chance to do that, to tell people about the quality of the people that you're working with. I think I also recognized, and I, I use this phrase a lot, not because I'm uh, trying to you know, be uh, cutesy, but um, when you are a young faculty, you are the sun. Everything about you as you're climbing in academic ranks is to bring attention to yourself, the things that you're doing, you know, uh, the, the quality of your care, uh, your talents as a surgeon, the things that you're writing, the service that you're providing in academic environments, in national organizations, etc. I believe that when you become a chair, you become the moon. And that is, 
everything about you is reflective glory in that really what you're doing is highlighting everybody else around you and any attention that you get is based on the fact that the people that you have uh, helped uh, do so well, they become the sun. Um, and so for me, I'm, I'm never proud of it when people talk about the fact that, you know, this famous person or this terrific surgeon or, or those other people are at Michigan and then somewhere along the list, they go, oh, and yeah, yeah, you're the chair there. Because I think that reflects the fact that I'm doing my job. And I know they talk about in industry and other places that you become a servant leader. I, I honestly think that's important. I think that chairs promote the people that they're working with. They um, look at their residents and make them the best that they can be. They make sure that those residents have the necessary uh, experiences, um, connections to be able to do the kind of jobs they want to do. They help their faculty by making sure that um, among national organizations and even within their own institutions, they get the opportunities to lead and develop their skill set. Um, they provide resources so that they can accomplish their goals, whether they be in the laboratory or in the clinic. And the other thing is, hopefully through a process which is both personal as well as departmental, you choose the next group of people that are going to come on board so that you create and sustain a department which is um, with the personal characteristics that, that you hope it, it will be. Um, and I'm very fortunate. I mean, I work with a group of people who every day inspire me. And that's why I think it goes back to the thing I said before. You know, if you choose a job for the people that you're going to be working with, it really does help you through the difficult times. The times that we've just gone through with COVID, uh, the difficult times that happen at any point in either one's own personal career or the institution's career that you're working in. What advice do you have for the graduating residency fellows as they enter the professional job market for the first time? I think when they're entering the, the, the job market for the first time, I think they should be careful to assess what their own needs are. And, and that is, what are some of the deal breakers that would make their quality of life unacceptable? Uh, for some people, it's location. It, for others, it's um, a proximity to either family or friends. Um, um, for others, it's opportunities within the academic environment. Um, for others, it's salary uh, and how much they're going to get paid. Um, you know, there's just a variety of things that people view as important. And I think it's, a, it's valuable to start assessing what those needs are, because I think for each physician, it's different. I do think that um, oftentimes people take jobs which by their simple analysis might not seem to be the best or most plum jobs and through their own talents make them into the best jobs. And I think people need to think about that because if you are in an environment where you can accomplish your goals, the fact that it may not be the environment that you want it to be may not be um, as important as how you can take that and move it in the direction you want it to go to. So um, I also recommend that for young faculty and for young partners, there is reason why first impressions count and why you can't get them back again. And that is um, really and truly, it's never changed, uh, at least as, as far as I can tell for physicians and for surgeons. It's that you're affable, available, and you're available. And if you can always do those three things, you're gonna be able to be successful as a, as a physician and as a neurosurgeon. Um, that capability means that you need to be able to be uh, a strong self-assessor. And that is when you make sure that you come out of your residency, you know what your talents and skill sets are uh, and that you need to know when and if you can do um, certain things. And if you don't or you can't, you'll learn how to do them. And learning doesn't stop at the end of residency and fellowship. Um, many of my faculty will go off even at points after they've been here for a while 
and say, really, I need to get my skill set on this or that. And I think a good working environment allows you to do that. We'll often learn things. We'll go off and uh, um, get new, um, uh, new skill sets, new things that may not be part of what your residency training was. Um, I do think also it's important that people uh, figure out how they, what they're going to do with their work-life balance so they can keep themselves sane, they can see themselves healthy. Um, and I think the other thing is to think about your career in small aliquots. What do you want to accomplish in the first two years? Hopefully for most neurosurgeons, it's getting board certified and getting your practice started. Uh, and then it's what's the, what happens at five years, what happens at 10 years, all of those things. Um, you have to also begin to develop mentors. Uh, as a woman who was a chair of a department, I realized that many of my colleagues had uh, a council of colleagues that advised them. And often these were folks that they played sports with or did a variety of other things with. Um, and people talk about it as the good old boys club. Well, there weren't a lot of, you know, boys in my club. So what I did was, um, I, you know, I developed a friend and, and colleagues. I have a Goggin, a good old girls network. And, the, you know, the, the women that I meet with, we meet on a regular basis at meetings. We have either a breakfast or a dinner together. And we try to be honest supporters of each other, uh, fair critics, um, but are there to help people sort of navigate what can be very tricky uh, for some of the political stuff that you need to go through when you're doing an academic practice. And, and that's been really helpful and supportive for me. Um, it just, it's, it's been, uh, I think, exciting and, and a lot of fun to be a chair of a department there are times when it's stressful. Frankly, this whole COVID has uh, made things a lot more complicated as a, as a chair. But I still feel really good about the fact that what my job um, has been and I hope will continue to be is to support uh, the people that I work with and the residents that I train to have the, ne the necessary equipment, the necessary opportunities so that they can succeed. Probably, you know, the, the two hardest things in this whole career for me have been the fact that I existed for most of my career in an environment in which there were not many women. And I've seen that change over time. And it has certainly been um, interesting and somewhat difficult, I think, to be a woman with a disability um, and to deal with all of that as part of my career. In some ways it's made it easier because I don't fit into any category and as such, all I needed to do is create my own category. And so I think for everybody, if they can find that place where they feel at peace with what they've chosen to do and how they do it, it really does make uh, what can be a difficult job a lot easier. So I am always privileged and grateful for the opportunities I've been given and the career that I've chosen, and most importantly for the loved ones my husband particularly, who has really made it all um, so much better. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.